2009 to through 2017, making him the longest serving member of President Obama's cabinet. In those years, Secretary Vilsack fought to put Americans back to work by investing in rural infrastructure, renewable energy, and large-scale conservation partnerships. Under his leadership, USDA introduced healthier food choices in school meals to benefit 50 million children and expanded free and reduced price lunches for millions of kids. Prior to his appointment, uh, or nomination and confirmation, I should say, Secretary Vilsack served two terms as the governor of Iowa in the Iowa State Senate and as the mayor of Mount Pleasant, Iowa. With that, I will turn it over to the secretary, who will be take a few questions um, once he concludes his remarks. Uh, Jen, thanks very much. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to be here today uh, with all of you. Uh, I'm here primarily to talk about food and uh, nutrition security, and you may think that that is uh, just about uh, food and nutrition security, but in fact, it's about a lot more than that. Uh, when you understand that 25 percent of America's workforce is directly or indirectly impacted by the food and ag industry, that it represents a significant percentage of our GDP, uh, that educational achievement is somewhat dependent on youngsters having healthy and nutritious food as they begin their school year and school day, uh, and the fact that it is a, uh, a noted uh, effort at reducing poverty, uh, food and nutrition security becomes an important issue. Uh, and certainly we've seen the impact of that uh, during the course of the pandemic. Uh, when the American Rescue Plan was enacted, uh, hunger in the United States was at 14 percent of our population, which was an incredibly high number. Uh, today, as a result of the uh, investments under the American Rescue Plan, we now uh, know that hunger has dipped to 8 percent of America's uh, population. That's a remarkable uh, drop in a six-month period. It is a result of extending SNAP, uh, as we did in the American Rescue Plan, creating a summer uh, EBT program uh, that will institute opportunities for uh, nearly 30 million children to have access to nutrition during the uh, summer months, uh, increasing our commitment to WIC, uh, and basically uh, making a, a, a down payment, if you will, uh, on hunger reduction. Uh, we have the opportunity uh, over the course of the next several months, as Congress considers the American Job Plan and the American Family Plan, to cement those, uh, those results and to actually build upon them. There are three key investments uh, for nutrition and food security uh, in the American Families Plan. Uh, first, uh, we're going to make permanent uh, this incredible and historic effort to feed kids during the summer months. Uh, there are, as I said, nearly 30 million American children who are in free and reduced lunch status in schools. At the end of the school year, uh, there is no a program other than a summer feeding program, which impacted and affected several million of those 30 million children. Now we have the opportunity to provide each one of these families uh, with a card that looks like this. Uh, this is the summer EBT card uh, that's available. Uh, it allows parents the opportunity to go to the grocery store as they do with their SNAP card and be able to purchase uh, additional fruits and vegetables and other uh, wholesome food uh, for their children, uh, ensuring that 30 million kids will have the opportunity to have nutrition during the summer, which means that they'll be better prepared to begin school ready to learn uh, in the fall. Uh, we're also extending uh, with this effort the opportunity to impact free uh, school meals uh, in high poverty school areas uh, by uh, focusing on the community eligibility program that essentially identifies the ability of a school district uh, where SNAP participation is roughly 40% uh, to extend uh, free meals to everyone in that school. Uh, this is going to expand uh, opportunities for youngsters to be well fed. And we know from a recent Tufts study that uh, one of the healthiest places in the country for children to eat is now in America's schools. Uh, so we're going to see that extended and we're going to focus with a, a specific laser like focus on elementary schools to make sure that our youngest learners uh, have the best possible opportunity. And finally, uh, we're going to uh, invest a billion dollars uh, with Congress's help and assistance. Uh, in trying to figure out strategies that will improve even more than we already have the nutritional value and quality of the meals that youngsters receive in schools. So these three uh, steps, these three key investments on the American Families Plan will allow us to cement the gains under the American Rescue Plan and hopefully impact and reduce hunger uh, to the point eventually one day where we won't have to have a press conference about, about hunger. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Andrew, you want to take us off? Yeah, Secretary Bill, a couple questions. One about the uh, mines that you, uh, the, the mine project that you had previously blocked, uh, and then the uh, Obama, Trump administration allowed those to open up. 
do you have any uh, particular view on whether that should be reopened or not? This is the twin metal copper mine. Uh, there's always a, a very difficult balance uh, to strike in any of these questions. Um, and certainly in this particular one, uh, you're balancing a, a pristine, incredibly important and valuable uh, uh, natural site, uh, the boundary waters of the Mississippi, uh, uh, tremendously um, unique um, area. It's one that the late Walter Mondale felt very strongly about, uh, and I, I know that uh, from a personal experience with the former vice president. He called me repeatedly on this issue. So you've got that on one hand. On the other hand, you obviously have jobs and economic opportunity. Um, and I think the challenge is to try to see if you can strike a balance. Uh, and that's what we attempted to do uh, in the previous administration, and I don't see any reason why we should, uh, why we should change that calculation, uh, trying to find the balance uh, between uh, preserving a pristine area and at the same time looking for ways in which job growth, economic growth can take place uh, in rural areas. And that's what we're going to attempt to do. Uh, there are no final decisions being made on this. This is obviously something we also have to do in conjunction with uh, the Department of Interior. They have a, uh, a stake in this issue as well. Yes, I, I, I just want to get to a bunch of people and have limited time. So go ahead, Alice. Sure. Um, one way of increasing SNAP benefits is by uh, reforming the Thrifty Food Plan. Um, and I know that that is under review right now. Can you talk a little bit about what that, that review entails and when we should expect um, results and how the reforms would be implemented if the, the program is reviewed? It's a complicated uh, question and one that hasn't been reviewed in detail for quite some time. Uh, and we expect and anticipate during the course of the summer months uh, that we will complete our review uh, and then have an opportunity perhaps to have a conversation about this in the fall. And this will be appropriately timed uh, because, as you know, the American Rescue Plan called for an extension of the increase in SNAP uh, over the course of, of the summer months until the end of September. Uh, so it's timely for us to look at this. I'd simply say that the principles that we're operating under in this area are, number one, the, the benefit has to be meaningful uh, to American families. With the American Rescue Plan, we saw an additional hundred dollars a month for a family of four being added to the groceries uh, the, to their grocery purchases it also impacts jobs as I said before uh, that snap benefit increased uh, and, and supported tens of thousands of jobs in grocery stores and across the food chain it also has to be conveniently available uh, that's one of the reasons why again the American Rescue Plan has provided opportunities for us to look at online purchasing uh, make it more convenient it has to be operated with integrity uh, obviously uh, and, it, and it has to be, uh, we have to look for ways in which we can incent and encourage uh, those dollars to be used in, in the best way possible to buy, provide the most nutritious benefit to American families. Uh, and that's the goal. And that's what we'll look at when we look at the, uh, the uh, Thrifty Food Plan. Alex? Uh, Secretary, uh, a group of Midwestern farmers last week sued uh, over the COVID, uh, a COVID loan forgiveness program, arguing that uh, it's unfair to them because they're white. Uh, your reaction to that lawsuit, and then it, you, you stand by the, the program's uh, structure? It's a great question. I appreciate it. Uh, I think I have to take you back uh, 20, 30 years uh, when we know for a fact uh, that socially disadvantaged producers were discriminated against by the United States Department of Agriculture. Uh, we, we know this. Uh, we have reimbursed people in the past for those acts of discrimination, but we've never absolutely dealt with the cumulative effect. And by cumulative effect, I mean this. When I have the full advantage of all the USDA programs uh, throughout the last 30 years, my operation could grow. I could invest in more land. I could get the latest and best technology. I could plant my crop at just the right time. I could make more money. If I had limited access or no access to USDA programs, obviously my operation significantly limited. So the American Rescue Plan's effort is to begin addressing the cumulative effect of that discrimination in terms of socially disadvantaged producers. Secondly, when you look at the COVID relief packages that had been passed and distributed by USDA prior to the American Rescue Plan, and you take a look at who disproportionately received the benefits of those COVID payments, it's pretty clear that white farmers did pretty well under that program because of the way it was structured. It's structured on size and structured on production. Uh, so I, I think there is a, a, a very legitimate reason for doing what we are doing. I think it has to be complemented with additional steps, which the American Rescue Plan provides, an equity commission to take a look at whether or not there are systemic barriers that need to be re, uh, removed uh, at the department, and, and also uh, taking a look at how we might be able to 
create better technical assistance, better access to land, uh, better access to markets for socially disadvantaged producers and for local and regional uh, food production. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue to proceed forward. Uh, understand that uh, litigation is going to be what it is, and we'll, walk, uh, we'll obviously have the Department of Justice and others uh, do what they do. And, but in the meantime, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is going to uh, move forward uh, with that effort. Thank you, Secretary Vilsack. You've just outlined the plans for the ARP funds through the fall to deal with some of the issues around hunger. How long do you anticipate those funds will last, particularly given that next year's school year will be unique, coming off of a year where most schools have been closed for the better part of a year? And will you need more funds from Congress to address this? Well, issue? I think that's one of the reasons why the President proposed the American Families Plan uh, as a continuation and as uh, allowing us to basically cement and make more permanent the gains that we've seen from the American Rescue Plan. In the meantime, we have uh, worked with schools, understanding they're faced with uh, a, a lot of uncertainty about the upcoming school year. And so we have already decided that we have available resources to be able to provide for universal free lunch for schools throughout the 21-22 school year. Um, and, and that will extend, I think, until the end of June 2022. With the passage of the American Families Plan, we would then have the summer EBT program to provide additional support and help. And that would give us, I think, enough lead time for school districts to be able to adjust back to what the new normal will be. In the meantime, we'll be looking at hopefully the use of the pilot under the American, Rescues, uh, under the American Families Plan to see if there are ways in which we can incent uh, additional nutritional value uh, for those meals, and we'll be using, hopefully with the passage of the American Families Plan, a more targeted effort in high poverty schools, elementary schools, to expand universal uh, free, uh, free meals. Okay, and that's the last one. On this idea of a carbon bank, since you've been on the job, what is the feedback that you've gotten from farmers, and is this something that you think needs congressional approval? You know, I was at a meeting yesterday with the Environmental Protection Agency Administrator. Michael Regan. He did a terrific job. We had uh, probably 25 farmers. Uh, I was very pleased with the level of support and interest that the farm community has for ways in which they can be engaged in this effort to reduce emissions and to be engaged in this climate effort. Uh, we had multiple questions about this in terms of how can we do this, not we're against it or we are opposed to it or we don't think it should happen. It was how can we do this? How can we be part of this? because farmers understand something very, very fundamental about this. This is the opportunity of a lifetime for us to create additional revenue opportunities for farmers. Now, why is that important? Because today, 89.6% of American farms, the majority of income does not come from the farm for those farm families. That means they have to have an off-farm income. So it's the Department of Agriculture's job to find more, better, and new markets. Climate provides that opportunity. Whether it's a fund, uh, whether it's conservation resources, whether it's uh, investments in technology that will allow them to capture methane and reuse it, or whether it's creating new opportunities for bioprocessing and new jobs in rural places, all of that has to be done. And I think the USDA has, has enormous capacity uh, and enormous set of tools that can be used to provide the resources to work with the farm community uh, to embrace this future. And I think they are in agreement with President Biden when he says the net goal here is net zero emissions by 2050. I think that's doable, and I think in doing it, I think we'll improve income opportunities for farmers. We'll certainly do right by the environment, and I think we'll also have healthier and better soil and cleaner water. Would it need congressional approval, a carbon bank? Well, it needs congressional approval in the sense that you have uh, resources in all of these programs that require funding. Um, we have a lot of flexibility already uh, at USDA, and we're going to be utilizing that flexibility in a way that creates more new and better markets. And I think farmers are going to find that uh, to be a very, they're going to be very agreeable with that. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so And as always, um, if you all have follow up questions, we are happy to connect you with this team uh, following the briefing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We'll love to have you back. Thank you so much. I'll just note my first campaign was for the Secretary's mm -hmm. um, gubernatorial oh. race in 2002, so mm -hmm. full circle. Um, couple of items, additional items for all of you at the top. 
Uh, this afternoon, uh, President Biden, as you know, will deliver remarks on Amer the American Rescue Plan's Restaurant Revitalization Fund, the administration's program to provide relief to restaurants, bars, food trucks, and other food and drink establishments. As we all know, restaurants were some of the first and worst hit businesses in the pandemic. The Restaurant Revitalization Fund provides $28.6 billion in direct relief to restaurants and food and beverage establishments and prioritizes those that are women-owned, veteran-owned, and owned by other socially and economically disadvantaged individuals by only funding applications from these businesses for the first 21 days of the program. Then it expands beyond there. Uh, earlier today, the president also visited one local restaurant that was a beneficiary of relief funding through the Revitalization Fund's pilot program. Uh, Taqueria Jimelas, I'm going to butcher that and I apologize, I want to go there and have some tacos, um, is owned in part by Mexican immigrants and during the pandemic went from 55 employees to just seven. So clearly uh, in great need. These funds will allow business owners to complete uh, delayed projects, rehire and raise the wages of their staff, pay their rent and operate with confidence again. Uh, applications for the program opens up on Monday and in just the first two days of the program, 186,200 restaurants, bars, and other eligible businesses in all 50 states, Washington, D.C., and five U.S. territories applied for relief. 97,600 applications came from restaurants, bars, and other eligible businesses owned and controlled by women, veterans, socially and economically disadvantaged individuals, or some combination of the three. 61,700 applications came from businesses with under $500,000 in annual pre-pandemic revenue, representing some of the smallest restaurants and bars and businesses uh, in America. Um, and uh, we uh, look forward to implementing that program. Uh, with that, I think we can go, Alex, to you. Questions? Uh, so the CDC's summer camp guidance is very strict, as Dr. Fauci acknowledged today. It requires even adults who have been vaccinated to wear masks outside at all times. It requires uh, children to be socially distanced. Um, can you explain why that contradicts uh, the administration's guidance that vaccinated uh, adults don't have to wear masks outside? And also, Dr. Fauci suggested that it may change as the science becomes clearer. But are, is the administration at all concerned that there won't be compliance with something this strict and there won't be compliance if it continuously changes? Sure. Well, first, I think everyone can expect that the guidance will continue to be updated and will continue to change. And I think as a parent myself of kids going to summer school, some, not summer school, summer camp, don't tell them I said that, um, you know, they, uh, I would welcome that. Uh, and there's no question what the CDC is trying to do is provide guidance to the American public, to parents, to families uh, that they can trust, that they know is reliable based on medical experts, doctors, based on data on how they can feel safe. The guidance that was, uh, re um, that was rolled out last week does not convey that when you're outside in a crowd, you, cannot, you should not wear a mask. If you are outside and you're not in a crowd then you, and you're vaccinated, you don't need to wear a mask. Uh, and obviously, uh, there is nuance in all of these applications and people are still learning how to apply it. Uh, but as kids are dropping off, as parents, I should say, are dropping off their kids at summer camp, as there are tons of kids, tons of parents, uh, counselors, uh, you know, that certainly wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be someone alone. But I think what Dr. Fauci was conveying, Alex, is that the data they're going to continue to look at the data and they want to put out updated guidance as they feel comfortable and confident in what they can provide to the American public. Sure. And there's a new um, evaluation of the American Families Plan out by the Penn Wharton budget model mm -hmm. and they found actually that the plan would increase the deficit and fail to grow the economy um, as much as President Biden has claimed. And so is, is there a risk in the long term that the president might not be able to fully deliver on what he's promised economically? Well, first, let me say we strongly agree, disagree with the analysis, as do other independent uh, experts. According to an, al an analysis out this week from Moody's, GDP in 2030 will be more than $700 billion higher than it would be without the Jobs and uh, Family, the Jobs Act, uh, the Jobs Plan, and the Families Plan. This is in large part because labor force participation will be nearly a full percentage point higher due to the effects of the benefits of child care, su child support, child care support, and paid family leave. And that same analysis found that the economic benefits would only increase over time due to increased college enrollment 
enrollment and universal pre-K, which will help some of the two million women who are no longer in the workforce get back in. The Penn Wharton model uh, analysis also off in a number of important ways. It gets the cost of the investments wrong by about $700 billion, even though our estimates come from career officials at OMB. Moody's, for example, arrived at deficits even lower than the administration, when it, than we had when it came to the effect of the family's plan. And of course, our plan would be implemented over a series of eight years and 10 years and paid for over 15. So we're going to rely on the majority of economic analysis out there and our own analysis in here, and we are confident we'll be able to reach both our job creation projections and, of course, um, do it in a way we can pay for it. And one international question. Um, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu missed the deadline to put together a coalition government yesterday, um, or a new governing coalition. Is, is the president monitoring the situation, and does the administration have any sort of response or perspective on the possibility of a new coalition government there? Uh, well, we do read all of your news coverage, uh, but uh, we are not going to comment uh, publicly on government formation while that process is underway. Go ahead, Andrew. Okay, so I have a couple follow-ups on, on Bill Sachs' answer, Secretary Bill Sachs' answer mm -hmm. on the Twin Metals thing. Is that a decision that you think will be coming at any point soon, or is that just sort of carved out? I don't have a prediction of that. Um, I would say I would refer you to the Department of Agriculture, and they would, of course, be the right source for that information. We can see if there's more follow-up on it uh, on the timeline. Okay. And then um, on the issue of uh, the G7 meeting and the mm -hmm. subsequent meetings with uh, Putin, have you, do you have any news for us on that front um, in terms of timing and also the agenda? Not quite yet. Um, as soon as we have... Uh, details or any confirmed details of timing, location, date, participation, we will of course share that with you and I would expect we wouldn't have more specifics on an agenda if and when we have it confirmed until much closer. And then just one more on my favorite topic of the WTO. Oh, I don't know the which one it waiver. is. Okay. <laughs> the trips waiver. So mm -hmm. this morning there was a meeting of the WTO. Catherine Ty made some comments during uh, an FT session talking about you know, time being of the essence, really sort of underscoring. There are multiple reports out also about kind of a division within the administration on this waiver issue. Can you just really walk us through what your perspective is on this and why? So that there are so many people in, in, in institutions and organizations now really putting pressure on President Biden to back this waiver. Well, I think it's important first to just take a step back and remind everyone that President, uh, the President spoke about his support uh, for uh, this type of a waiver back during the campaign. Uh, but it, it, we are running a process. We have been running a process uh, in the administration uh, that includes all stakeholders in the administration. And he is somebody who has welcomed people of different views. He wants to know the details. He's a details guy, and he wants to dig into the pros and cons and all of the considerations for any decision. Uh, as we look at this decision, what we're really talking about, I know you know this, Andrea, but for, for others, um, we're really talking about the U.S. position as it relates to the WTO process, right? And that process will take a series of months uh, and requires um, a uh, unanimous point of view to move forward. Uh, so what we are, the consideration now is the U.S. position. Our objective overall as we look at this decision is how can we provide as much supply in the most cost-effective way to the global community? And clearly there are steps we've announced, we've take, we're, we're in the process of taking, uh, d providing uh, 60 million doses to the global community once we have that available uh, that are AstraZeneca doses. Earlier this week, Pfizer announced they'll also be sending doses or manufacturing doses for the global community. And we're going to continue to work with our partners. I expect we'll have more now that the WTO meetings are underway. We'll have more to say very soon on this. Are you concerned about setting a precedent that could be, so even if India and South Africa narrow the proposal, which is apparently something that's going on, and maybe you could ask, you could, you could confirm that that is your understanding. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, even if that proposal is narrowed, are you concerned that you're going to be setting a precedent that could harm U.S. companies in the future? Which is what, you know, we hear from U.S. industry. Well, clearly as these decisions are weighed, we take intellectual property incredibly seriously. Um, and uh, we also, though, are in the midst of a historic global pandemic, uh, which requires a range of uh, creative 
uh, solutions, um, and we're looking at it through that prism. It sounds, I'm sorry, Jen, I just want to be very clear. It sounds like you're pushing us or leaning toward some kind of a, 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 a waiver of some kind. I, I'm not trying to give you an indication. I, that obviously would be an announcement uh, or a decision that would be recommended by the uh, USTR and a decision I would expect that would be made by the USTR. Uh, but what I'm trying to give you an understanding of, which I think was your question, is what the considerations are in the thinking and decision. I think a decision will be made soon. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I have questions on a couple of different topics. The first is um, on the debt limit. Is the White House concerned about being able to avoid a government shutdown and raising the debt limit considering the Treasury is unsure can you, how long it can use the extraordinary measures it has? Um, and what's the White House's strategy for pressuring Congress to agree to raise or suspend the debt limit? Or are you leaving that to Treasury to figure out? Well, first, I will say that um, on the issue at hand, um, raising or suspending the debt ceiling does not authorize new spending. Sometimes I'm not saying you're confused about that. Some people sometimes are. Uh, it merely allows Treasury to meet obligations that Congress has already approved. So certainly they would be in the lead, as they have historically been in most administrations, on making that case. Uh, we expect uh, Congress to act in a timely manner to raise or suspend the debt ceiling, as they did three times on a broad bipartisan basis during the last administration, including the same year that the former president uh, signed into law tax cuts that uh, added uh, $2 trillion to the deficit. So uh, we certainly expect they will move forward, uh, that this is something that has been done in a bipartisan basis. Democrats and Republicans have called for it in the past, and uh, that's what we'll be advocating for. Um, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell said this morning, um, when asked about kind of the issues within his own party, um, that quote, 100% of my focus is on stopping this new administration. Um, and he touted kind of the, the unity within his caucus from Susan Collins to Ted Cruz. Um, are you concerned that it will be difficult to work with Republicans when you are when you have these kinds of statements coming from their leader? Well, I guess the contrast for people to consider is 100% of our focus is on delivering relief to the American people and getting the pandemic under control and putting people back to work. And we welcome support, engagement, and work with the Republicans on that. And there's the president has extended an open arm to that. The door to the Oval Office is open. He's invited Senator Capito to bring a group of her choosing to the White House next week. And we think there is opportunity uh, for agreement uh, to deliver on uh, on uh, relief to the American people. One quick question. Um, a judge this morning struck down the CDC's national moratorium on eviction. Do you have a response? to that and the administration's plans to appeal I, potentially? Yes, I do. We understand, and this just happened as you alluded to this morning, we understand the Department of Justice is reviewing the court's decision and should have more to say later today. Uh, we also recognize, of course, the importance of the eviction moratorium for Americans who have fallen behind on rent during the pandemic. A recent study estimates that there were 1.55 million fewer evictions filed during 2020 than would be expected due to the eviction moratorium. So it clearly has had a huge benefit, but we would expect that a response and any, of course, decision about additional action would come from DOJ, and you may hear more from them today. Uh, go ahead, Kristen. Thanks, Jen. Uh, Facebook has decided to keep former President Trump off of its platform for now. Senator Ted Cruz tweeted the following, for every liberal celebrating Trump's social media ban, if the big tech oligarchs can muzzle the former president, what's to stop them from silencing you? What do you make of that comment? Does he have a point? Well, let me first say that um, this is an independent board's decision, uh, and uh, we're not going to have any comment on the future of the former president's social media platform. That's a decision that uh, it sounds like the independent board punted back to Facebook to make in the next six months, as I know you all have reported. Um, the president's view is that um, the major platforms uh, have a responsibility uh, related to the health and safety of all Americans. Uh, to stop amplifying untrustworthy content, disinformation and misinformation, especially related to COVID-19, vaccinations, and elections. And we've seen that over the past several months. Broadly speaking, I'm not placing any blame on any individual or group. We've seen it from a number of sources. Uh, he also supports better privacy protections and a robust antitrust program. 
So his view is that there's more that needs to be done to ensure that this type of misinformation, disinformation, damaging, sometimes life-threatening information is not going out to the American public. You're saying more that needs to be done. Are there any concerns, though, about uh, First Amendment rights? And where does the White House draw the line on that? Well, look, I think we are, of course, a believer in First Amendment rights. I think what the decisions are that the social media platforms need to make is how they address the disinformation, misinformation, especially related to life-threatening issues like COVID-19 and vaccinations um, that are, are continue to proliferate on their platforms. I want to ask you also, Jen, about police reform. President Biden said he wanted it done by the first anniversary of George Floyd's mm -hmm. death, May 25th. Is he confident that Congress can meet that benchmark? Where do those negotiations stand? Well, the negotiations are between members of Congress. So, uh, and he, uh, of course, is confident in the those discussions and the work that is happening under the leadership of everyone from Congresswoman Karen Bass to Senator Cory Booker, obviously Senator Tim Scott, who he called out in his uh, speech uh, just last week. And we are uh, we we remain uh, we are in close touch uh, with, of course, uh, negotiators and kept abreast of their progress. Uh, but we will wait to see what comes out of those discussions. If you do the math, though, this puts police reform in some regard ahead of the negotiations one would think for the American Families Plan, the infrastructure plan, which he set an end of the summer deadline for. Is this now the president's top priority? Does he want Congress to tackle this first? Well, I would say that the president believes uh, Congress can and should move forward with multiple uh, policies at the same time. And uh, certainly, that, that is what is happening on Capitol Hill. Uh, you know, those members who are playing central ro roles in these negotiations, and obviously they can speak to the frequency of the discussions and the status of them, and we defer to them. Uh, they will be important participants, of course, in any outcome of negotiations around the American Jobs Plan, but those negotiations can happen simultaneously. Just, just finally, Jen, how does he see his role? I mean, he's the one making this call to get this done. Has he reached out to Tim Scott, the person who's leading the charge on the GOP? Side? I don't have any calls uh, or engagements to read out to you, uh, but I can say that as you know, a number of representatives of the families were here just last week meeting with some senior members of the White House leadership. Uh, the president has talked about how it's long overdue to uh, put in place uh, police reform measures that that will help rebuild trust in our communities. He uh, used his joint session speech, the highest profile moment uh, in a first in a president's first year to talk about that and make the case. And uh, but the negotiations are happening between members of Congress. He feels that's the appropriate place for them to be. And we will continue to uh, use opportunities to call for this moving forward. Uh, go ahead, Kristen. Uh, Kristen, 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 I got confused. Caitlin, there's a lot of K's. It's a Wednesday. Go ahead, Caitlin. Right. Kristen and I also have been dressing a lot lately, so it's fine. Not today. Um, Kristen has a very good mask on today. This Kristen, both of your masks. Go ahead, okay. My question is on these restaurant funds. Yes. When will they start being awarded, and does the president envision having to ask Congress for more money for this? Well, on the second piece, um, well, first, the first awards as part of the pilot program will be funded Friday. So we're this program, not the pilot, the, the, sec, the actual part of it, not the pilot. Those who applied this week uh, can expect up to, uh, up to 14 days on average from submission to funding. So it will be a very rapid turnaround. Okay, and does he envision asking Congress for more money for this? When Congress comes back, we are happy to discuss the best ways to further support small businesses, including restaurants hurt by the crisis. So he's certainly open to that. And as I noted, there has already been a large interest in this program, um, and uh, there are great needs across the country from these small businesses, from these restaurants that are uh, uh, in communities across the country. So we will, we're happy to have a conversation with Congress about that. Okay, and my question on the patents, you were talking about how the president last summer expressed his favor for waiving these so countries would be able to mass produce these vaccines once they're ready. Of course, that was when they were not ready yet last summer. Yeah. So just to be clear, is that still his position? That has been that has been his position. He also believes that there needs to be an internal policy process. That's what's been ongoing. The recommendation, the appropriate process, the recommendation to come from uh, the USTR, uh, and then any announcement about a decision would come from USTR. And that's how government should function and should work. And as uh, and I noted in response to Andrew's question, there are of course considerations. Uh, but we're also uh, in the midst of a global pandemic, and we are our objective is to getting uh, as much supply uh, out into the global community as as quickly as possible in the most cost-effective manner as we can. 
did he communicate to Catherine Tai, his trade representative, before these meetings with the WTO on this are underway? Well, there have been discussions happening here uh, in a, uh, through a policy process. I don't think his comments he made last summer are a secret. Um, they're certainly not. Uh, but again, he's a believer that you need to have all parties at the table, everyone providing information, hearing details, pros and cons of every decision. Uh, and that's exactly what he asked for from his policy teams. So given what he's heard from the policy teams, from the health experts, people like Dr. Fauci have weighed in publicly about whether this would be helpful mm -hmm. in making vaccines right now or if that would be further down the road, but is, is his position still what he said last summer, which is absolutely positively, he will ensure there are no patents standing in the way of other countries and companies mass producing these life-saving vaccines. That has been his position, but he is the President of the United States who believes in the advice, the counsel, the considerations of his policy teams, uh, and that has been the process that's been ongoing over the last several weeks, and I expect we'll have more to say quite soon. It's also important to note, just, uh, just in response to one of the things you said, that uh, this is not, this would not be, this is about the U.S. position. There would be an entire process at the WTO that would be likely be months. Uh, in the making. Uh, and that's just how the process works. So there's also a consideration leading up to that. Okay, thank you. Okay, go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Uh, yesterday you said that the CDC engaged with around 50 stakeholders when coming up with these guidelines for reopening yeah. schools. So in addition to the teachers union, the American Federation of Teachers, who are these other roughly 50 stakeholders? Well, let me give you, I'm not going to read all 50, because you know, but, and I'm happy to send them to you after. Um, but just as an example, while I find this lengthy list, um, you know, they include the YMCA, they include um, the Council of Chief State School Officers, the National Association of School Nurses, the National Governors Association, Big Cities Health Coalition, Autism Speaks, Council of Great City Schools. Uh, so there's a range of organizations, and as we were talking about yesterday, the objective is to have a better understanding of implementation, uh, how it would work, and ensure that these guidelines can be implemented and they would not provide harm to the communities that they would be impacting. But can you just explain maybe just a little bit more, you know, why the CDC needs all of this input from so many outside entities? Why can't it just come up with these science-based guidelines on its own? Well, they do so sh to ensure that the recommendations are feasible to implement and that they adequately address the safety and well-being of individuals the guidance is aimed to protect. And that type of consultation is pretty standard as a part of their consideration processes. One other topic. Sure. Right now there is a huge Chinese rocket in outer space that's going to be crashing down to Earth likely on Saturday, and nobody knows exactly where. It'll likely be in an ocean, but it could, or pieces of it could come down over a populated area. And this isn't the first time that China has allowed, knowingly allowed, something like this to happen. So does the White House condemn this kind of repeated reckless behavior from China's space program? Well, let me first say that U.S. Space Command is aware of and tracking the location of the Chinese Long March 5B in space. Uh, and obviously the Space Command would have more specifics on that tracking and, uh, and additional details. Uh, the United States is committed to addressing the risks of growing congestion due to space debris and growing activity in space. And we want to work with the international community to promote leadership and responsible space behaviors. It's in the shared interests of all nations to act responsibly in space to ensure the safety, stability, security, and long-term sustainability of outer space activities. So cooperation is a hallmark of our approach. We're going to work with our international partners uh, on that, uh, and certainly uh, addressing this is, is something we'll do through those channels. And just a quick follow-up. If this rocket does cause some, some serious damages here on Earth, would the White House enforce China paying some sort of compensation as required by the UN liability, Space Liability Convention? Well, um, again, I, I think we'd, have, of course, uh, refer to the advice and uh, guidance from U.S. Space Command and Department of Defense and others, uh, but we're not at this point. Uh, we are certainly tracking its location uh, through U.S. Space Command, and uh, hopefully that's not the outcome that we are working through. Okay. Go ahead, Eli. Um, thanks, Jen. Um, I'm just interested if you have any response to some of the moves made this week by a few Republican governors to uh, get rid of, you know, protections that were in place for people, public benefits, also public health restrictions, uh, basically sending the message that the pandemic is over and sort of uh, criticizing Washington, the CDC, uh, the bureaucrats, as Ron DeSantis put it, for telling people they still need to wear masks indoors, uh, those sorts of things, saying that the vaccines have worked. 
Um, how are you trying to thread that needle by celebrating the progress of all the people who have been vaccinated and keeping these things in place and also trying to keep people from viewing this through a political lens? Any outreach to any of these Republican state officials about the message they're sending uh, and any response to them from the podium? Sure. Well, first, um, we not only do a regular a governor's call every single week um, with governors from across the country, from red states and blue states, to talk about implementation, any changes we're making to allocations, as we talked about just yesterday. Uh, but we also have regular engagement with governors and local officials about uh, where the public health guidance is going, uh, questions they have, and even sometimes challenges they have in their communities. Our position from the federal government continues to be that the public health guidelines are in place to keep people safe, uh, not just governors and leaders of states, of course, but people in communities, families, kids, people who are in vulnerable populations, and that uh, we'll continue to communicate that from the federal level, even as governors are pulling back uh, their implementation in some places where it might be premature. As you, the president yesterday was talking about transitioning from the mass vaccination centers largely in urban and suburban areas and trying yeah. to really be more deliberate, um, proactive about getting the vaccine to people in outlying areas, rural areas. Uh, is there any concern about having enough vaccinators uh, to reach people in those areas? Will this mostly be run through local pharmacies or is there going to be a similar effort to uh, authorize different people in sort of medical fields to be able to administer vaccines? Well, we did take that step uh, some time ago to expand the um, type of individuals who were qualified to be vaccinators because early on we recognized that it wasn't just about supply, it was also about locations. And obviously, as you alluded to, we've made some changes and adjustments, uh, but also about vaccinators and ensuring that a larger group of individuals, dentists, veterinarians, others, could uh, also be eligible to uh, do the vaccine and get it into people's arms because we want to ensure that in a range of communities across the country, there's a range of options for people who can do exactly that. Uh, so that's not a concern that uh, we are tracking at this point in time, a lack of, because we did a lot of work preparing uh, for those needs. And I would say that, um, you know, there were some mass vaccination sites we opened even last week. But what we announced yesterday is a kind of a phased approach based on the phase we're in uh, at this point in time, which is uh, that we are recognizing the daily numbers will go down a bit because we're at a such a high percentage rate relative to where people thought we were at this point in the pandemic. And we know it will be harder and harder to reach people and meet people where they are. Hence the increase, as you suggested, in walk-in hours or the announcement of walk-in hours on mobile units, on partnerships with primary care physicians and doctors to make it even easier and more accessible for people to get the vaccine. This one more on, on tomorrow on the trip to Louisiana. So far, the president has mostly traveled to states that are you know, competitive swing states. Louisiana is obviously a red state, but has been impacted by COVID. Except for Texas and Ohio. <laughs> well, okay. Mm -hmm. But I mean, there's been a lot of travel to some of these states. Can you just talk a little bit about the, the takeaway that people should have when they see the president showing up uh, you know, in deep red Louisiana tomorrow and the issues that he wants to to draw attention to? Sure. Well, first, the president, when he was elected, uh, knew from day one he was going to govern for all Americans, and that was going to be his objective. And so even if it's for people who didn't vote for him, for states who didn't vote for him, his uh, focus is on delivering for them. So tomorrow uh, he'll make two stops in Louisiana. Uh, his focus will be on talking about the American Jobs Plan and how that plan, uh, in a historic investment in infrastructure, rebuilding the type of bridges, roads uh, in Louisiana that are long overdue to be upgraded, could help uh, not only people's travel and commutes, uh, but also create jobs in these communities. And uh, it's not about just delivering for people who voted for him or people who uh, have uh, blue check marks next to their name because they're Democrats. And that's uh, part of what this message should send, this visit should send. Go ahead, Hans. Uh, I get that you sort of prefer the Moody's model over the Penn Wharton. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if the White House is gonna accept whatever CBO and JCT scores the president's proposals at. Well, I think our issue with the Penn Morton model was the data it was based on and that it was off. Uh, and so we'll have to look at what the data uh, that any future analysis is based on, and then we'll give an assessment. Okay, so even official, you're not embracing whatever the official assessment will be from CBO and JCT? Well, Hans, there is no assessment at this point in time. Our assumption is that they would be abiding by accurate data, so we'll look forward to seeing those assessments. And when do you expect those assumptions and data to come in? I don't have a prediction of that. Thank you.
uh, suggest you ask them. Go ahead, Alex. Uh, does President Biden agree with Governor Whitmer's decision on the oil and gas pipeline? She's citing essentially water quality issues. Uh, it's, it's really angered Canada. Does President Biden agree with that decision? Uh, I'd have to take a closer look at the pipeline. I mean, we have been evaluating in a case-by-case -case scenario. Which, which pipeline are you talking about? The Enbridge. The Enbridge one. Uh, we look at each pipeline uh, through the prism of the impact on the environment uh, and also the impact on the economy, uh, and we make assessments. So I'd have to talk to our team if that assessment's been concluded or not. Okay, and, and the president's going to be talking about implement, implementation later. Mm -hmm. What sort of oversight uh, plans are, are being talked about as far as the spending and making sure it's... For the restaurant program or just the programs in general? In general, in general. Inspector generals, I mean, can you give us an, a, an idea of what sort of oversight is being talked about? Well, first, uh, the president uh, came into this job having served uh, as the person overseeing the implementation of the American uh, Rescue and Recovery, uh, the ARA, ARA uh, back in the early days of the Obama-Biden administration. He takes waste, fraud, and abuse incredibly seriously. And we have put in place uh, changes and reforms to programs at SBA and other programs that, that have been implemented where we've seen um, incidents of that in the past. Um, it's also why he has somebody, Gene Sperling, overseeing uh, the American Rescue Plan implementation to ensure there is coordination across government, that we are tracking uh, where we see issues. Uh, and certainly, uh, he's somebody who welcomes oversight and wants to do everything we can to reduce any waste, fraud, and abuse in these programs. And just finally, I wonder if the president or anyone else in the administration uh, spoke with the Treasury Secretary yesterday, given uh, some of her remarks that she uh, then sought to clarify. Well, the secretary herself uh, addressed her remarks later in the afternoon, so I'm not aware of any calls yesterday. Um, she will be here in the briefing room, and they'll have their regular economic briefing on Friday. Go ahead and back. So I want to talk about climate for a second. Um, the president had said in his executive order in January um, that he would call for a green procurement plan for the federal government, mm -hmm. and part of that was about buying electric cars. The deadline for that plan was April 27. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the status of it is and why the delay? Uh, I don't have an update on the status. It is something, as you noted, he talked about early administration. He is absolutely committed to, but I'm happy to check with our team and see where our uh, report on that lives. And um, I also want to ask, does the Biden administration have a timeline at this point for issuing pardons and commutations? Uh, I don't have any uh, previewing of that to provide and probably won't from here. Uh, go ahead in the back. Uh, yes, is the Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti un under active consideration to be the ambassador to India or any other country? I don't have any personnel announcements or assessments to make here uh, from the podium, uh, but hopefully we'll have some more formal announcements on ambassadors soon. And uh, the Tokyo Olympics are 12 weeks out. Mm -hmm. uh, at what point does the president need to make a decision about his attendance? His attendance? And, his, and what factors are delaying the announcement? Well. I think the president uh, and his team uh, assess any invitation uh, as it comes in, but 12 weeks is some period of time. I don't have any up updates or predictions on whether or not he'll travel or uh, accept the invitation made to attend the Olympics. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, two questions. First, on uh, the large sports arenas that are beginning to allow uh, for fully vaccinated fans in special sections. Uh, both uh, City Field and Yankee Stadium in New York have made mm -hmm. those announcements, and I know there are some others. Does the administration think that that is a good approach for uh, sports teams to take, uh, and maybe other large event venues? And are there any concerns about uh, equity when it comes to access to facilities if particularly those that were built with some public money in some cases, I'm sure, uh, when it comes to people who may not have been able to get vaccinated yet? Well, first, everyone in the country is eligible to be vaccinated, and certainly at this point in time. Uh, so we are, and we, as we've noted here, have taken a range of steps to ensure we are meeting people where they are, getting these vaccine doses out to communities around the country. Uh, in terms of an assessment of the safety of 
this approach by sports teams. I, I'd have to talk to our COVID team about that. Uh, and I think it's unlikely we're going to be weighing into every private sector decision about uh, how they're uh, moving forward uh, once people are vaccinated. But I will check with them uh, on that. Okay. And then the other the other question, if I can follow up on the uh, the debt limit question just a little bit. Sure. Has there does the does the president have a position on whether or not the debt limit itself should exist at all? Considering every every you know couple of years we go through this question of what are the extraordinary measures and how much extra time do we have? And we know at the end of the day that it's going to have to get raised or else we're going to have some sort of economic calamity. Uh, does the president have a view on the question more broadly of whether or not there even should be a debt limit? Well, first, raising or suspending the debt ceiling doesn't authorize new spending. It merely allows Treasury to meet obligations that Congress has already approved, right? Uh, it has been the case for many years, um, and there have been bipartisan votes to support. Um, so. You know, the president does believe that Treasury should be able to meet its obligations and believes that Congress should move forward in a bipartisan manner, as they have historically in the past, including three times during the prior administration. Go ahead in the back. Uh, thanks. Um, on the, the G7 trip, um, mm -hmm. is there any advance on whether the president will meet with the Queen? And uh, separately, um, has the president or the First Lady been in contact recently with Prince Harry? Uh, I don't have any more trip details. Um, who among us wouldn't want to go see the Queen? Uh, but I don't have any details to preview at this point in time. I expect as we get closer to the trip, we'll have more specifics. Um, and uh, I don't have any calls or engagements uh, with Prince Harry or uh, Meghan Markle to, uh, to read out for you with the President or the First Lady. One follow-up, is, is there a timeline on an announcement for the British Ambassador? A timeline? I don't have a timeline for that. Any names or any anyone other considered? No names to float out there for you. Uh, hopefully, we'll have some more ambassadors soon to soon. announce. When right. you say soon, will that be before or after he makes his decision on going to the Olympics? <laughs> I can't order for you, Hans. There's just so much excitement to stay tuned for around here. So we'll see. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>